So welcome to my presentation, Side Channel Analysis for Cheapskates. So I've given this at some previous Black Hat, Black Hat Abu Dhabi, Black Hat EU 2013, as well as the Atlantic Security Conference. So this is sort of a version of it that I'm going to give you on YouTube here. And I hope you find it interesting, and I hope it introduces you a little bit to all about this side channel analysis stuff. So I'm from... Halifax, Nova Scotia. Here's a photo of some power analysis occurring over Halifax. And I always have to thank the people that made this work possible, in this case my funding providers, Dalhousie and this OZ Optics scholarship I'm working on. So a quick overview of the presentation. I'm going to talk about what is side channel analysis. I'm going to introduce some of the software. I'm going to introduce some of the waveform acquisitions, give you some example attacks, give you some amplifiers, a uh, quick introduction to how you might measure currents in real devices, and the most important aspect, I think, is where you can go from here. Uh, this online version of the presentation, I'm actually not going to show all the live demos, uh, because they'll be covered in other videos. You can see some of my example side channel attacks and software videos up here in my channel anyway. So the motivation for this sort of work is that first, it's not for script kiddies or elite hacksaws. So this is all about learning about side channel attacks, learning about how we can analyze these systems. You will have to understand how the attacks work. There, there's no simple push button attack that I'm going to be providing here. So it's not a case of here's some software, you attach the device to it, and you just run the software. It just won't work like that. You will have to learn a little about hardware design, so in this case, the boards that I'm attacking, as well as the capture hardware itself, as well as programming the boards and things like that. And I can guarantee you will get frustrated, you'll run into bugs that are in my tools or in other parts, and you're going to have to fix and debug the stuff yourself. So the motivation that I'm really trying to push here is that this is all about learning on your own, and this talk is about how you can actually get into this stuff. So what is a side channel attack anyway? And in case you don't know, the basic idea is that if we have a cryptographic device, it has the main channel. As well, it'll have some other ways you can get information from it. So the main channel, for example, you could say if you have a cryptographic chip on your chip and pin credit card, is the contacts that you are used when you insert the chip into the reader. But it was shown at one point, and this goes back to actually 1998, it was first really published, using the power measurements of the device, you can sort of see what the device is doing. Oops, it's too far. So if we look at the power being consumed by the device, we can actually learn something about what exactly the device is doing. And ultimately, we can learn things like the secret key that are supposed to be impossible to recover. So this seems sort of freaky-deaky and when you ask people about it, they say, oh, it must be a lot of magic, like it must be insane math. But it's actually very simple, and I'm going to show you how this works using sort of a very generic example. Say we had some digital logic chip called the Crypto Pro 9000. Inside it, there's going to be various parts connected by a data bus. This data bus is effectively just wires at the end of the day. So we have, in this case, I have you know some RAM and an arithmetic logic unit, so maybe this is like a generic microcontroller. Those data bus lines are, as I said, wires, and they're driven either high or low to put them in a state of one or zero. This is how we send data around the chip. But importantly, you could also think of those data bus lines as a capacitor. That is to say, to put them in a state, we have to put charge on the line, or we have to charge and discharge this capacitor. Um, we know that to change the value, the voltage of this capacitor, to put it up one or to put it to zero, physically takes power to do that. It takes a finite amount of charge to change the state of that data bus line. Because it's digital logic, everything's synchronized to a common clock. So this means that at one clock edge, all of those data bus lines are going to switch at once. So if we consider a very simple case where we have two data lines, what you might see is that when it's switching from zero to one, you would see a spike on the power measured in the VCC, so in the top 
a switch. These are just electronic switches here. So the top switch here, you'd see the power going across this. In the other case, we would have a we would have a switch on the negative side. So when we see these going down, we see sort of a little dip downward into the negative side here. So a quick note, um, one thing you'll run into is these two different power models, which is how we predict what do we expect to see based on the data on the bus, what's happening on these power measurements. So we can see this very basic idea is sort of the core part of power analysis attacks. Knowing the data on the bus, knowing something about it, we can learn what's going on in the power channel and sort of vice versa. So the two different models, as I call them, or they're called, is the first one, Hamming distance. This is to say we're measuring every time a bit changes from zero to one, we see this spike. So this is like what I've shown here. The other one is Hamming weight. Hamming weight is saying on each clock edge, the power consumption is actually proportional to the number of ones on or number of zeros, depending which way you measure it, on the data bus. So it's really directly proportional to the absolute state at that moment in time, not what the previous state was. And why we get this is microcontrollers and certain devices tend to put their bus into a pre-charge state so rather than going directly from one state to the next, there's an intermediary state that pre-charges it halfway. The logic being that rather than going from, in a worst case, your bus switches from all zeros to all ones, uh, this will sort of limit how fast your chip can run. So you do this pre-charge, obviously, where you go halfway all the time. Now your worst case state has been reduced since in every point you're switching from the pre-charge state to the final state which will be you know half the charge is required so how do we do this in real life I've shown you well how we can know something about the data on a bus based on the power but it hasn't fully revealed how do we actually crack a cryptographic system so the key to this is these intermediate states in the crypto system so you can imagine this crypto system with a secret key. Uh, we put in a plain text at A, it encrypts it with a secret key that we don't have, and you get out a cipher text at B. Knowing A and B, it's totally useless to you know the attacker. They can't derive the secret key. But there's intermediate points at C that are easier for the attacker to use this information. If the, they knew a and C, for example, you could figure out the secret key or part of the secret key. Um, so using side channel attacks, we are essentially figuring out these intermediate values we can't physically probe. So let me take you through a sort of simple example of how we do find these intermediate values, how we probe them. So say we had this chip that has four bit lines on it. And let's say what it does is it XORs an input plain text, which we can control with a key which we can't control which we don't know either and there's an output which is totally unavailable to us so all we can do is input data it XORs it with the secret key and does something else with it and we can't reach that final XOR output so somehow we want to figure out the secret key what we can do is say we physically can measure the power across the device because we externally have access to it. So we could put a resistor in the power line and measure the power on every clock cycle that the device is doing it. And say we knew exactly when this XOR operation is occurring. Um, and even if we don't, as I'll show in a second, it's not a big deal to figure it out. But the point is that we can measure the power as it's doing the XOR and when we're controlling the plain text input. So what we would do is we would put in a whole bunch of random input plain text. Now, by a whole bunch here, I'm just showing seven. In reality, you might need only a few. You, for the attacks I'm going to show later, you'll probably need between 10 and 1,000. Um, and the original DPA attack, you may need more than thousands to get any sort of result. So anyway, we put in, say, these seven random input plain text. We could guess what the key is. There's 16 possibilities for that key. We don't know what it is. Um, and if we guessed 
each of those 16 possibilities, we should could also come up with this set of hypothetical results. So for each guess, we could generate a set of hypothetical results corresponding to the input. So there's 16 sets of seven um, hypothetical results. The original DPA attack paper, how it used this is you take each of those 16 hypothetical results. Again, we don't know which of them is right. One of them we know is right and corresponds, the guess corresponds to the real hypothetical key. One of them's wrong, or the rest of them are wrong, sorry. So we could look at a single bit of those four data lines, and we could say in this case bit zero, and I'm just gonna say what is the state of bit zero? And let's assume this is Hamming weight, so that means that the system is leaking the state of the number of bits on the data bus line. So what this means is we could take all of the power traces, all of the power traces where that bit is zero, and put them on one side, and take all of the power traces where that bit is one and put them on the other side. Um, over time, if we have put in all this random data, the rest of the bits will effectively, on the bus, so remember we only looked at bit zero, but there's also bit one, two, three, but the rest of those will effectively average out to 0.5, um, in both cases, but if we, if our guess is right, and thus the division of traces is right, what we should see is that single bit will always be either the zero or one we expect it to be, and when we look at the traces, so I'm going to add up the traces on one side where I have the transitions and add up the traces on the other side where here I say no expected transitions, that's to say the bit is zero, the bit is one, and I should see this big difference between the two sets, because if I'm correct, it means that in one case, this bit was in fact always one, so there's a tiny bit more power taken than in the other case, when that bit was always zero, and there's a little bit less power right at this point. So we can see that there's a bit of a sort of bump right here, um, where that XOR is taking place, and the rest of the time it's just purely random, there, there's no uh, correlation there, so they should average out to the same. And obviously if you have more traces, this average looks better. Now remember that, so we can sort of see right there. Now remember that I said I was just guessing, so we actually would have done this 16 times, and we would have just looked at each of the 16 possible divisions of those traces, which one generated the largest sort of bump here? Which one do we think was actually correct? Um, and that's simply what we did. We just guess each of the 16 possibilities and we look at which one looked sort of the best. Now this isn't the, by far the most powerful attack. This is the original one, one introduced shortly after, which is um, more powerful but still pretty easy to understand and I'll show it here is correlation power analysis, or CPA. So in correlation power analysis, what we're doing is we're taking those same random input plane texts, so again, we put in, say, seven random input plane texts, and we're gonna do the same trick where we generate 16 hypothetical keys. So remember, it was a four-bit number, we don't know what it was. We do the same thing, we generate this set of 16 a set of 16 where we have seven hypothetical results for each of the possible hypothetical keys. In this case though, I'm gonna take the hypothetical Hamming weight for each of these 16 um, key possibilities. Now what I can do is correlate the actual power measurement across every trace with these hypothetical values and simply look at the correlation uh, for every case. Um, and what you expect to see is that if you have the correct hypothesis, you'll have this highly correlated system at, at one point in time um, because you're always able to predict what the power consumption at that point in time is because you're saying this power consumption is based on this hypothetical value that I know. Um, so this is sort of the very base of how side channel analysis attacks work. The simple idea example I've given you, it fails pretty easily. Um, attacking XOR is not ideal. 
as there's actual several solutions to the problem set. Any key with bit zero cleared gives you some um, the same result in output bit zero, for example. So in real systems we're attacking, we're looking at um, stuff like the S box or mix calls or X time or something sort of more nonlinear. Um, so in AES, for example, we have a whole number. There's these 16 subkeys, and we might look at the output right here. So after we've inserted a plain text. Uh, we've XORed it with our guess. So again, we'll guess all the 256 possible values, and we'll say, if I'm right, I know the power consumption right here at this point in time, whether it be when that piece of code is executing or physically what that device is doing. Um, so the real power here is that we're actually just guessing 256 possible keys times 16, not having to guess 2 to the 128. So this is what makes side channel analysis attacks possible. So maybe this makes more sense written out as an algorithm in this way. Correlation power analysis, I input many plain texts, and I measure the power. For each of the 256 key guesses, I calculate a what I expect the S-box output to be. So I'm going to look at, for example, this first subkey here, and I'm going to say, I guess it's zero. Um, for all of the plain texts I input, so you know I might input 100 or whatever, uh, I guess what would the S box output be in each of those cases. For each case, I use my power model to predict at that point in time, if I'm right, what does the power trace look like? And then I measure how closely my guess is matching the physical measurement, in this case using correlation. Um, and you just repeat that for each of the 256 guesses for that subkey. Whichever guess results in the best match, that's probably the right answer, and you just go with it. And you just repeat that times 16. Um, and that's the simplest way to explain correlation power analysis. So again, there's the AES system. So the software that I've sort of introduced here is called Chip Whisper, or I call it Chip Whisper. And Chip Whisper is a collection of open source tools, um, open hardware and open software, for getting into power analysis, especially on the cheap, is the whole point of it. So there's a Git repository for everything. There's a wiki uh, for documentation that I'm updating. There's also a mailing list, so if you want to ask questions, put them all there, uh, and then sort of everyone can see them or answer them. There's two main software projects going on right now. There's a capture project, uh, which interfaces to a scope, in this case the open ADC, and interfaces to target boards. And there's the analyzer, which applies attacks to the power traces. Everything's totally open source, GPL licensed, and it is written in Python, um, which if you're doing data analysis at first you might think is crazy, but Python can easily interface to a lot of other code like C++ or MATLAB, and it has several libraries for running fairly high-performance code on it. It's obviously not generally going to be as fast as something you've written in C or C++, but for learning, again, the whole point of this tool chain is all about learning, not absolute best performance. So the Chip Whisper Capture application looks something like this, um, and you can see I can connect to different targets, and then just capture a bunch of traces. So again, there's some other videos on YouTube where I show these tools in use. Chip Whisper Analyzer um, looks something like this. So here I've loaded a trace and I've run the attack. And we can see, remember how I said before, there's this correlation. So this graph at the bottom has overlaid all of those 256 possibilities and it's plotting the correlation between the predicted value and the actual measured value. In red, I've highlighted the, the result of the plot for the actual key that I know to be true because this is my own device. And we can see these huge peaks um, at some various points. So this is for one of the particular bytes. You can click on either, any of these to get each of the subkeys. And the others are sort of fallen behind here. So there's actually 255 other traces all plotted in green behind this, but the ones in red are the correct ones, and those are the only ones that are really spiking out. So if you wanted to do this, what's sort of some of the steps you might need to do? Well, we need to measure the power. That 
should be an obvious part of power consumption or power attacks. This is something what a typical setup might look like. You have a power trace, so we have a board under attack, um, which is an FPGA based board here. We have a scope in the background, and then we have the connections, the shunt measurement, as well as the trigger. Um, and this is fairly typical. You can look into various other academic papers. I'm not trying to, you know, just claim that everyone uses really expensive stuff. And part of it might be um, because some of these labs do have access to good scopes, so they're just using them anyway. But you'll find many references to attacking hardware devices where they sh show that you, in fact, do need to sample at very high rates. They, you know, below a giga sample per second some targets will simply fail. The attacks on them will not succeed. So it's very difficult to get a good giga sample per second scope for, you know, under a few thousand dollars. And on a much simpler target, so these software devices I'm attacking, you can get by with, you know, worse oscilloscopes. So what I'm showing in this graph is what I call the partial guessing entropy. So this is how sure we are of um, the results versus how many traces I've recorded. So this is to say when I've taken 10 measurements, so you know I've put in 10 random values and recorded the output, it's the system is not very sure. When it gets down to zero, that means it knows with absolute certainty what the correct key is. Um, so we can see here after about 20 measurements, so I've put in 20 random plain text and measured the power, I'm getting some good results. And if we go onward, if we use an oscilloscope with 100 mega samples per second instead of 500, we're starting to get out here near 80, you know, samples are needed. And as we go to 50 mega samples per second, it gets a little worse. And then once we go to 25 mega samples per second, it's basically failing. Um, even out here at 100, 100 traces, it's, you know, not working at all. So in real systems, um, measuring, you know, 100 traces might be trivial, but the point is I've also purposely taken a very, very simplistic target. When you look at you attacking physical hardware, you might find that, you know, this trace here is your 500 or giga sample per second trace. Um, and you might not even really be able to get capture hardware that can go down to here. Um, or the device might have countermeasures or things like that. So this isn't at all anything in the remote case of an absolute example, but I'm trying to show you, you know, how much better we can get. And how we can get better is we can acknowledge that all of these measurements are taken with an oscilloscope, which uses what we call an asynchronous sampling clock. So it has its own sampling clock just going all the time. Um, we can look at the device under attack, and we can use its own clock uh, to reference when to take the power measurement. So the end objective is really to measure on these clock edges here. So what we do is we use the device clock to time exactly when the measurements occur. And what you can get away with then is using much, much slower capture hardware. So this diamond figure here is showing seven, around 7.4 mega samples per second, so you can see it's slower than anything else in the graph, um, but it gets very good results. So the key is that by perfectly synchronizing your s sample clock to the device clock, you can get away with a far simpler capture system, and this is where the cheapskate part comes in, because you can get away with very low-cost capture hardware. Um, in this case, I'll show you some plots using a clock that I've multiplied by four uh, to sort of give a little better shapes basically. There's no actual need to do this multiplication by four, but it looks better. Um, so what this is showing is how much of a difference that synchronization makes. So in A, I've sampled a device doing power analysis at 96 mega samples per second, or 100 mega samples per second, and in B, I've sampled the same device at 96 mega samples per second. In both cases, there's 10 um, power measurements overlaid on each other. But what's happened in A is that it's taken asynchronously, so the samples have not perfectly lined up. In B, it's sampled using the synchronous technique I just mentioned, and everything, you know, lines up 
perfectly. You can't even see that there's 10 samples overlaid there. And where this comes from is that in a regular oscilloscope, you have a sample clock running all the time. So, you know, if you have 100 mega samples per second, then you have this clock running at 100 megahertz, timing all of the samples. And it's running all the time. Normally, they have some sort of circular buffer so that when your trigger goes, you know, you get some, you can see some view before the trigger happened, and you see some after the trigger happened. So they just have it running all the time like this. But what happens is that, say, the device clock um, is running at a different frequency on its, you know, its own clock, and at its clock edge, this is where the encryption starts. What's going to happen is you can't trigger the oscilloscope right at that clock edge. Um, or you can trigger it, but the sample itself is not going to be taken until the next sample clock. So the next sample point is going to be over here. When you do this again, the device clock is just running all the time. Oops, sorry, something just fell here. And what you're going to find is that now, you know, the device clock went high here, say, so this is where the encryption starts. And then all of a sudden the sample has occurred way over there. So we have this sort of jitter. And the normal way to compensate for this, or what most people have done, is they've just increased the sample speed. So it's a bit of a hack, but obviously by increasing the sample clock, you'll reduce how long the maximum time is between the device encryption occurring and the very next sample can occur. So if you, if you want to use a normal oscilloscope that can't do this synchronous sampling, um, a few tips. You can actually sort of do the reverse where you output the sampling time base from the scope. Uh, you almost would definitely have to hack the oscilloscope. If you have a cheap USB-based oscilloscope, you might not mind doing this. Um, and this will ensure perfect synchronization. Some scopes can tell you the time between this trigger and the first sample, so this time I've shown in here. Uh, this isn't perfect because you've still thrown away information because the sample has not occurred at the same point, but you can do some tricks with either upsampling and shifting and things like that, uh, which could improve your traces. And a key thing is that if you are using a regular oscilloscope, um, it's best to sample at the highest possible rate you can. You might not want to sample at such a high rate because it will generate so much data. You know, if you're sampling at a few giga samples per second and your device under attack is running quite slowly um, and you need to measure several milliseconds worth of data, this isn't going to be good because, you know, it's just going to keep filling up buffers, filling up your hard drive with all these samples and it takes a long time to analyze them. But what you can do is you can still sample at a very high rate and then actually downsample it. And what that's doing is because the sample clock is running so fast, this minimum time is still very minimal, is still as small as possible, um, which means your initial sample is going to be well synchronized to the device clock. And I've done some other tests. I don't have the graphs in here, but it shows you that you still get pretty good results, you know, sampling at 500 mega samples per second, down sampling to 100 mega samples per second. The results are far, far better than if you have sampled at 100 mega samples per second. So what I had claimed initially is that using synchronous sampling gives you, you know, very good results. And here's a comparison of this, which is another example. Um, so we have a, I have some hardware device I've attacked called the Sasebo, and you attack it at two giga samples per second, so a high-end oscilloscope, and it's giving you similar results to attacking, doing the measurements at around 96 mega samples per second. So to give you an idea, if you want to buy an ADC, if you wanted to build your own something, even a, to, and measure two giga samples per second, that's going to be very expensive. To measure this, you know, 96 mega samples per second is $100 or less. So this is the capture hardware block diagram I'm sort of showing here. So this is the physical hardware. Um, so what we can see is that in the middle here we have an ADC. So we have this ADC block here. Um, we have a variable gain amplifier, which lets us scale the input signal as needed. And there's a bunch of stuff that occurs inside the FPGA. So the FPGA in this case is either this board here or um, this other FPGA board here. So 
all of this part is the open hardware part, so the hardware design, um, PCB layout, and everything for the ADC board is open. And as well, there is ADC boards that you can purchase if you wish. This ZTAX board in this case I'm using, or there's this LX9, um, you can use either. The LX9 has a much slower USB interface, and I never got the Ethernet fully working, so I currently recommend this ZTAX board as it has a very high speed USB interface, so it's a lot snappier when you're doing the measurements and sort of a lot more fun to use. The downside is you need to build this little adapter board. Um, if you don't want to build anything, just, you know, get the LX9 board for now. I'm making an adapter board so you don't have to build this, but it's not available yet. You can use a bunch of other FPGA boards too. You can basically use any FPGA board with a ADC. Um, so if you are a hardware guy and you already have some experience, you might not need to buy anything at all. So as I said, there's you know the open ADC with various FPGA boards equals capture hardware. I should note you can get, and you should check if you have a scope, um, some of them have synchronous sampling support. Not too many of them do, but there are a few that um, either have it or can add it as an option. And this might make a sort of very easy way to get into side channel analysis. So if you want to get into it, what might your first attack look like? Um, you might say, well, should I attack a smart card? There's lots of people I see doing that. So this is a programmable microcontroller card. Um, it's actually an Atmel AVR microcontroller on this card. It's not a special smart card programmer or smart card micro. You can do this um, if you want, and you can do something like buy a smart card reader, and you can actually add a shunt to measure the current. You can pull out the clock and synchronization signals um, right from the reader and modify it. So there's the modified reader. And connect this up to the ADC board or connect this up to your scope. Um, if you're cheap, you don't even have to buy a full-on reader. It depends a lot on the type of card you want. This isn't nearly as flexible as you know this commercial reader I've shown here, but for these simple microcontroller cards, this super cheap, super simple reader um, actually works. And the super simple reader is just a USB to serial adapter combined with some other electronics crystal oscillator and such like that, you know, so this is like a $5 reader, basically. But before I go into a lot of detail on the smart card, I really want to push this point that the smart card, this AT Mega card, is just a commodity microcontroller. So it's no different than taking a microcontroller such as in the Arduino, and interfacing to that and attacking that device. There is zero difference between the two. It's And it's specifically because this microcontroller that's often used when demoing these attacks is just a simple, straightforward micro. It's not a smart card micro, which has countermeasures to these type of device attacks. Um, so what I recommend is to skip the whole smart card you know, business, and just go straight to build your own system. So here I have an AVR microcontroller on a breadboard, and that's basically it. You can make it on a PCB if you want, and that's a little easier. So you can see I have a shunt resistor here. Um, this shunt resistor is where I measure the current across. I have a crystal um, for the frequency, and then I'm outputting that to the sampling system to get the synchronous sampling. So, you know, very, very simple method of doing it. And if you want to do that yourself, there's all the details. They're in the white paper, um, which is also some of the details are in the Git repository. Everything's linked from the YouTube comments, though. Um, I'm using this Colorado Micro Devices USB to UART, and you can use any real USB to serial cable if you want, though. And you obviously need the capture hardware. Um, again, all the demos I'm using are with the open ADC, but potentially you could get a whole bunch of other scopes to work on this too. Um, so you can build it, uh, program the AVR, 
and then you can test the AVR is working. It's this super dumb, simple protocol where you send it the key, you send it a plain text, and it responds with a cipher. Assuming that works, you could start to characterize the device. So you always need to look out for noise in the system. Noise is going to hamper your efforts because that'll mean that you're trying to find out, you know, at this point was the power higher or lower than average. At this point was the power higher or lower than average. If you have a lot of noise in the system, your measurements are going to be fairly meaningless because now at this point it might have been thrown way higher due to noise and way lower due to noise. So here's one example where what I've done, I've taken the power input and I've just connected it to the scope and with the amplification I'm going to use. And there's a ton of noise that's, you know, basically going to be useless. So you can start by adding things like filtering capacitors. That alone, as you can see, was not enough. Um, two different capacitors. What ends up working well is you can do stuff like use a low pass, make a low pass filter. So I just have a resistor here combined with the capacitors to give me a really smooth sig signal. Once you've sorted out the power supply, we can add a shunt uh, into the VCC line. And then we can characterize the system. So characterizing the system is basically we confirm that if I repeat the same encryption, I get this sort of stable signal. So you're going to use the persistent mode in your scope, be it the open ADC or any generic oscilloscope, um, and set up things like the gain to be give you a good signal. Um, and again, here I'm using this fixed plain text. So it's always sending the same encryption. Once you have it set up, you can just acquire a whole bunch of traces. So depending on the type of attack you need, it might only be 100 traces or it might be 1,000. So this early example um, on these slides are actually using this DPA attack. Um, but you can use the chip whisperer instead, which gives you the access to the correlation power, correlation power analysis attack. And this is a lot more powerful, and you could easily record something like only 100 traces. All right. So in the real presentation at this point, there would be a demo of this attack, but as I said, I'm not doing it in the YouTube version because there is a few other sort of example captures and a few example attacks on my YouTube channel, and I'll be updating them um, independent of this presentation too. So one other thing you might be interested in is I've at some uh, conferences, there's been demos where they actually don't even insert this shunt. They just have a smartphone or have a device sitting on a table, they have some probe over it, and they say, using this probe, I can magically do this power analysis. And what this probe is, is a magnetic field probe. So as current flows, it generates a magnetic field. This is, you know, very basic physics, effectively. So you can buy probes easily, um, these H-field magnetic field probes, you can just buy from various vendors. But they're pretty pricey, you know, $2,500 for one set, plus the amplifier, 2,000 for this other set, and so forth. So it adds up quickly, but you can actually build your own very easily. And all you really need at the end of the day is this loop of wire, um, loop of this coaxial wire with a slot cut in it. And you can sort of wrap the thing in non-conductive tape or dip it if you want, and you end up with this very nice, maybe not nice looking, but nice working magnetic field probe. And I'm not just making this up, there's a good, really good reference here um, that I encourage you to go to this first and read about some of the, this guy making these magnetic field probes, different types, different options, and how they perform. There's also a good uh, thesis that dealt with magnetic field probes for side channel analysis. So this is specifically looking at cryptographic devices and building different types of probes and comparing them to commercial ones. So between those two references, you should be able to, you know, get a very good probe going. You also need a preamplifier. That's because the signal from these probes is just so small. And you see these preamplifiers all when these probes are being used with a scope. They always have one in there. Um, if you use the open ADC, it does have a preamplifier, but it's not quite powerful enough. Um, so you'll need something else. Now you can buy commercial preamplifiers from places like mini circuits or other RF type um, places. But what you're going to find is that 
a they're not super expensive they're way cheaper than when you buy them elsewhere um, but they have a bit of a problem that they're somewhat designed for RF devices so depending on the type you get they may not work well when they're not matched that's to say they might even oscillate um, so if you're using them in an environment that is properly matched then you can just very easily buy one of these um, that perform very very well but you can also build one for even cheaper uh, so there's something like these chips uh, for 60 cents you can build a preamplifier chip or you can get a preamplifier chip and it needs some supporting electronics around it so you need you know capacitors DC block capacitors and I've added an LED here but nothing major so there's a little preamplifier I built on a piece of uh, proto board it's not you know not great RF but we're using them at pretty low frequencies so I'm not using this at a gigahertz you know using it at 10 100 megahertz somewhere in there uh, so there's a example PCB board design again it's all in the repository if you're interested so the results are pretty good it gives you 20 dB equivalent to about 100 times gain up to around 400 megahertz so you'll notice it dips off um, at lower frequencies so this straight lines only from about 80 megahertz onward but uh, when I zoom in between 100 kilohertz and 10 megahertz, so you know way on the left of that curve, it's actually not as bad as it might at first look. That scale in this figure is quite, um, you know, quite extreme here. So here we show that it sort of will start down. Oops, sorry, and it will dip way up like this. But um, we're still getting about 40 times gain over this 0.1 to 10 megahertz range. So it's not too bad all in all and for the cost it works pretty well and you can use this connect it directly to the H field probe and then plug that into your other systems some other things you might run across is a differential probe differential probes are used to eliminate common mode noise um, so for example at the end of the day we want to measure the current the voltage across that resistor because it's proportional to the current through it but if we just measure one side of it, um, such as I was doing before, we're going to have this problem that we're not actually measuring the voltage across the resistor. We're measuring the voltage at one side of the one end of the resistor, and there could be common mode noise um, that's actually on both sides of it. So that's not going through it. That's lying to us effectively. So if we use this differential probe. Um, it's measuring only the voltage across the resistor and will give us better signature. So you'll very frequently see this. This is um, one of the probably I'd say most common things that's used when doing these measurements with a physical shunt. Uh, unfortunately, they're quite expensive. So here's from an academic paper um, using a differential probe, and that specific one they're using is to buy new something like $4,500 uh, but it's good to a gigahertz so it's a very high-end probe you could get a version of it that's uh, more limited bandwidth limited 200 megahertz you know you're still talking $1,700 so that's not ideal even eBay they're you know even used they're still expensive so what you can do if you're really cheap is you can actually build your own differential probe using a chip you know there's this chip that's used for amplification and uh, you can basically add some voltage uh, conditioning voltage supply and stuff like that and bam you've got a pretty good probe you know it's obviously not standing up to that thousand dollar type range but for the stuff we're doing it's more than good enough and there's more details PCB layers and I'm having some some PCBs made as well of these um, so I had a few extra photos of things that also can tie into the presentation that might interest you. Um, there's some other hardware. If you're not interested in the total cheapskate way, the Sasebo W board is quite advanced. Um, so there's a company out of Japan that does a lot of work around targets for side channel analysis. And again, they're not quite as cheap, but they have a lot more features. So this has a massive FPGA on it. It has smart card readers set up, and it can actually, you can plug the open ADC right onto this. So this single board, you can do all sorts of stuff right on, like uh, high-speed attacks, you know, in hardware. Um, 
some of the other targets you might see, X Mega, you can build up. Again, there's some more details in the wiki, so this is just showing you if you want to attack different devices, not just that one AVR I showed you. Uh, running software AES, the X Mega has a hardware AES crypto processor you can play with. You can even do stuff like attacks on Arduinos, uh, which are, you know, AVRs at the end of the day, but in this way you can use the Arduino bootloader and Arduino programming environment uh, to have a sort of super low cost, super simple target. Um, and you can even start to explore things. So this is an unfinished project as of right now, but check, you know, check on the Chip Whisper wiki to see if anything gets updated there. Uh, I've been looking at using the X Mega device itself, which has a two mega sample per second ADC, to do the capturing of data on. A key part of this is synchronizing the device to that ADC clock. What this means is you can no longer actually feed the clock out of the device into the scope. You have to do it the other way around. The X Mega is generating a two megahertz clock, which you will have to feed into the device you're attacking. And that device, um, that 2 megahertz clock, it will then be synchronized between the X mega device and your target. So if you want to learn about side channel analysis, this is very good because this board here is $30. Um, and that could be your capture pl platform. And you combine it with, you know, another cheap piece of hardware that's doing the actual AES. Um, and you could have something like a $50 side channel analysis intro platform. So this is all about the intro platform, not attacking real targets in this case. Um, these are more just for reference. So if you have, if you're interested in saying, hey, what what might different software look like when I'm doing attacks? Um, on AVR, there's a lot of different AES implementations you can run. So I give you a bunch of examples on the Chip Whisper Ricky, and I'm just showing you Here's uh, AVR Crypto Libs, an open source AES library. So it's used in probably some real products. I obviously don't know for sure, but it's a very popular AES implementation in C. Uh, they also have an AVR Crypto Lib in ASM. So what you can see is that the assembly language one, the assembly language is much faster, and you can see in this power trace that on the far right here, um, you know, it's it's all over basically within. 11, 1500 or so samples, whereas the AVR Crypto Lib in C, uh, you can't actually see how long it's taking, but this is only the first few rounds are shown in this photo. It doesn't even show the complete encryption. What this means is that the assembly one is actually slightly more difficult to uh, attack, and what you'll find is it takes more traces. So you can start with the C, move to the assembly, and then move onward to other targets. Uh, the X Mega is another example of a target, so we have this C implementation, and they even have a hardware AES implementation. So, if this type of stuff has interested you, where do you go from here? What do you do? Well, um, on newae.com slash blackhat, that's where I have links to these specific presentations, but you might just be interested in checking out chipwhisper.com. There's a mailing list and a wiki there. Uh, in general, if you want to read about this, there's this really good book, uh, Power Analysis Attacks, Revealing the Secrets of Smart Cards. And I would highly recommend just starting with this um, because it covers sort of all of the different types of attacks um, in a basic way and some different countermeasures, and it's very interesting. And it's going to be your, your best bet introduction for sure to this whole area. You can also start looking at different papers. So you can start with the original DPA paper by Paul Kosher, and it's actually quite an easy read. It's quite good. You can get it for free online. Um, there's also two main conferences in this field, and you can look at proceedings of that over time. Uh, as a hint, if you find stuff that's behind a paywall, a lot of universities will have access to these, so you can use a computer like in the university library to read stuff that's beyond these paywalls. So, thanks for attending the presentation and ignore the speaker feedback survey part. That's from the Black Hat uh, presentation slides. But if you're interested in learning more, you can check out chipwhisper.com. It's probably the best bet or newae.com slash blackhat. All right, thanks everyone.